and Ed Turret Tortoise. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Um, so this evening's event, as you know, is to discuss beauty standards, plastic surgery, and the question of really how far we're willing to go to change the way that we look. And I don't know if it's because I'm now over the age of 30, but it feels to me like everywhere I look, I'm getting adverts for Botox and fillers. Something has definitely shifted in the algorithm that is saying to me, you're now on the aesthetics hit list. And um, it's even gotten to the point where my driving instructor um, was a full-time driving instructor, but part-time was training as an aesthetics pr practitioner. And at the end of each of my driving lessons, she would ask me to pull down my mask and she would suggest a little injection here or a little bit of Botox there. And at the time that she was doing it, I was probably much more open and uh, to those sorts of suggestions because like everyone else, I'd spent 18 months staring at my own face on Zoom as I am doing now. And I was sort of sick of it. Um, and of course, you know, lots of us, particularly women, and not alone in this, if you think about Love Island, lots of 21 year olds, uh, with plenty of work done, uh, the age in which people are getting into their face has really, really dropped, but also the same in Hollywood films. It's rare to see a woman over the age of 35 who hasn't had some work done. So it's clear that there's been a sort of mainstream shift in what we think about beauty and, and the things that we're willing to do to our faces and our bodies. And so that's really what I'd like for us all to talk about this evening is um, how beauty standards are shifting because of a wider accessibility to procedures. Um, but uh, also, I guess, the sort of bigger question, question, which is whether we're sort of losing our grip on the reality of what we look like. Um, we have three uh, brilliant contributors uh, here this evening. I'm not sure if I'm cutting out a bit. Hopefully not. Um, we have Dr. Uh, Ariane Shadi Kurosh, who is a assistant professor of dermatology at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, Louisa Tarasova, who is a personal injury attorney uh, who focuses on cosmetic procedures uh, and the injuries that arise from them. Uh, and she is uh, particularly interested in cool sculpting, which is a case that I have become uh, very interested in myself over the last few weeks. And we also have Ollie London, who is an influencer who uh, identifies as transracial. Uh, and I'll let them uh, talk more later about um, how that's led them to change the way that they look. Um, there are two ways that you can get involved. You can contribute in the chat where my colleague Mark is uh, also chatting away. Um, and you can also raise your digital hand uh, by clicking at the bottom of your screen and I'll try and bring as many of you into the conversation as I can. Um, really that's it for me. So I'll come first to uh, Dr. Shadi Kurosh, just to try and understand at the beginning, I suppose the landscape of what we're talking about here. Um, the pandemic has obviously, there's been a big shift, uh, but before that, what were the kinds of procedures that you were seeing that would be particularly popular and who was getting them? Well, we've seen a rise in cosmetic procedures in general in the population over the past 20 years. If you look at you know, searches and numbers of procedures done that are surveyed by national medical organizations, for example, in the US, we have the American Society of Plastic Surgery, the American Society of Dermatologic Surgery, and they conduct national surveys each year of the doctors that are in their organizations about the number of procedures that they're performing. And there's been a consistent rise uh, you know, in the past 20 years, not only among total of procedures that are being done, but newer demographics. We've seen increasingly men uh, getting cosmetic procedures and also younger and younger people uh, getting cosmetic procedures. So this was a trend even before the pandemic, um, but as we've you know, discussed and as, as we may be discussing in, in this segment, there were certain features of the pandemic that we think triggered uh, even more people and people that had never even previously considered cosmetic procedures to suddenly be seeking them. 
Sorry, my mic was muted there. And tell me, as there's been this kind of much wider constituency of people getting, you know, different procedures done on their face and their bodies, how has the sort of consultation process changed in terms of being able to have access to this kind of, um, whether it's surgery or injections or various other kinds of procedures? I, I think that's a great question. And it's something that in some cases has always existed, the, the principles that we're seeing now, but then also has changed as a result of our, of our current conditions. I think that as aesthetic physicians, as physicians that are board certified in dermatology and plastic surgery, for example, there's a certain amount of training and sensitivity that one needs to have in order to really take care of the patient as a whole person. For example, we are trained in aesthetic medicine. For example, aesthetic proportions that you know, may seem the most natural, the most correct, the most youthful to sort of help a person reach their goals. But we are also trained as a part of our medical training in principles of psychiatry, you know, to ensure that um, the person that may be seeking these procedures may not also, for example, benefit from other interventions. For example, if a person comes in and you really sense as their doctor that they're having a lot of anxiety or that their concerns seem to be disproportionate to, you know, what you as a physician assess you know, to be what they might be able to benefit from. So I think that, you know, this is one of the many reasons it's important if a person is considering an aesthetic procedure to make sure they are seeking the counsel and that they're under the guidance and the care of a board certified physician who is not only trained in aesthetic medicine and aspects of psychiatry, but who is also trained to take care of the health and well being of the person in front of them. And, you know, in this day and age, you know, as you touched upon, it's particularly a sensitive issue because there is direct to consumer marketing of so many procedures um, that may or may not be, uh, you know, appropriate for a person, especially of a certain age. You know, I have patients that are increasingly coming in and asking for procedures that would actually make them look older if they had that done, you know, and for, for a, a 21 year old person, for example, I had one situation where she inquired about removing the fat from her face, you know, and I had to sort of counsel her about the fact that her face looked appropriate for her age and that she looked youthful because of it, you know? And so with, um, you know, with this direct marketing to people, and then also in the age of social media, where you have, you know, influencers that are, you know, influencing young people and they are, you know, increasingly having cosmetic procedures done. And a, a lot of young people are looking to them as, as role models and not necessarily to the medical community. And so I think that, you know, raising awareness about getting the right kind of guidance uh, is very important. And you, you say that the, the market has changed, but have the, have the sort of principles of beauty changed? Because you're talking about sort of, you know, the, the rules of aesthetics that you would apply to a face, but I've read things about sort of Instagram face and, and Snapchat face. Is that something that is changing the actual practice of aesthetics themselves? And another great question. And the answer is yes, that while there are certain proportions and certain features of appearance, in terms of evolutionary biology and nature that would favor health and favor fertility and, and, and things like that, those are much more general than the our um, perception is shifting based on social media. Yes, uh, for example, in the old days, my mentors who have been practicing aesthetic medicine for 20 or 30 years would tell the story of patients that would come in with a photo of a celebrity who they may not remotely resemble and say, make me look like this person. And so, you know, the doctors of that time were sensitive to, to helping people understand what would be an appropriate or realistic aesthetic goal to make that person maybe look like a version of themselves from a few years ago, rather than like someone else. Mm. Now we have a situation uh, which was documented by some of my colleagues um, several years ago called Snapchat dysmorphia, where 
patients would bring in altered photographs of themselves uh, using the filters uh, or photo editing apps that would sometimes alter the proportions of the face and the head in ways that even the most advanced plastic surgery could not achieve and which did not look natural. So, so to your question about realistic um, goals being altered, I think this is, this is true and it's definitely the case that people that have been editing uh, their appearance and, and also viewing the edited appearance of others online may be shifting away from the understanding of what a natural face or their own face um, actually looks like. My research team at Massachusetts General Hospital here at Harvard Medical School conducted research around this, uh, this issue. And you know, we found first, first we, we wrote about a phenomenon called Zoom dysmorphia, and then we studied it through the pandemic as you know, in the past year and a year and a half, as we've now sort of returned to in-person activities in some cases. And when we did a follow-up study and asked people about, you know, returning to in-person life and work, the people that expressed the most anxiety about this were the people that also reported spending the most time on social media and utilizing filters and photo editing apps. So we're sort of locked in a loop in a way that the more time you spend online, the more time you might use filters to enhance the way that you look digitally, it, it impacts on the way that you then feel about yourself in, in the real world and sort of locks you in. But zoom, zoom dysmorphia, which is a term that I know that you, you, you and your research term, uh, team have used a lot um, and, and coined, is slightly different to the filter uh, yes. dysmorphia. Yes, that, that's a, another great question. So what I described before about Snapchat dysmorphia, a term that was coined by, by some of my colleagues several years ago, is a phenomenon that a person is at least in some degree aware of because they know that they are editing their appearance. And, and so even though their perception of normal and their perception of, of their own appearance may shift over time as a result of this habit, uh, at least to some degree, they're conscious of it. The phenomenon of Zoom dysmorphia, which, by the way, I always um, clarify is not a medical term. Okay, so in order to be diagnosed with body dysmorphic disorder, a person would need to uh, seek the, the counsel of a mental health professional, such as a psychologist or psychiatrist, and meet certain criteria and be diagnosed. So the, the term Zoom dysmorphia is more of a descriptive term that we used to describe the circumstances in the pandemic where the abrupt shift to life on video conferencing had an effect on uh, many people in terms of their perception of their own appearance and their comfort with their own appearance. And there were a lot of aspects that went into this. And the way that this differs from Snapchat dysmorphia, for example, is that with Zoom dysmorphia, many people were unaware of the effect that it was having on them because they were not used to staring at their own reflection for hours on end, day after day. And what they didn't realize also is that it was a distorted reflection and that it, it wasn't really looking in a mirror. It was looking in a funhouse mirror, for example, because people were not aware that the webcams, for example, on our devices, on our laptops and on, on our smartphones, for example, actually distort the image in ways that could be unflattering for a person. And so when, um, when my research team and my colleagues and I became aware of this anxiety that people were having, we actually did a little research into the technology. And I consulted with a colleague who is actually a photographer about the way that cameras alter appearance. So for example, even in classical photography, there is this concept of image distortion that can happen based on the distance from which a photo is taken. So as, as we've seen, you know, professional photographers usually have different lenses that they use to, to photograph people from different distances. And if we are extremely close to the object, it will distort the proportions of the object. Now, what we found in researching the, the front facing cameras on our devices is that this concept of image distortion is exaggerated. And what's worse about this is we tend to use our devices at close range where the problem would be exacerbated. We, we sit closer to our laptops and we hold our smartphones uh, at 
much closer distances than a, than a photograph would classically be taken. And we also hold them at strange angles that could make us think that we look much more unflattering than, than we do in real life. So I think a huge part of this was educating people that there was a reason that they were becoming self-conscious about their appearance. You know, even in psychology, in the psychology literature, even before the pandemic, there was a concept of mirror gazing. And there, were, there was published literature that people that spent uh, unnatural amounts of time, or let's say more than average amounts of time looking in the mirror, became self-conscious about their appearance. And here we were in a situation where suddenly people were forced to look at themselves and their own image on video conferencing. And as I said, it, it was a distorted image. So imagine if a person suddenly had to look at their own distorted image, like in a funhouse mirror for hours on end, day after day, and they didn't realize that it was distorting their appearance. And they were subconsciously just thinking that they looked awful all day long. And so suddenly this was taking a toll on a much wider range of the population who had no idea they felt like they looked so terrible. Well, I'm sure there'll be lots of people on that call, on this call, who feel quite relieved to hear that they're not the only ones who who feel like they might not always be looking their best on screen. Um, just um, Dr. Shelley, I just wanted to ask about the kind of the market um of of procedures that are out there, and I know that there are lots of very popular um brand names. Can you just talk us through what are the most prolific brands and, and procedures that are out there at the moment. If, for example, I came to you and said, look, I've been looking at my face on Zoom all day. I can't stand it. How can, how can I fix this? Well, the first thing that I would tell you is I have a feeling it's not as bad as you think. And why don't you come into clinic and, and we'll look at the mirror together in person and, and really decide if it's as bad as you think. Um, because, you know, in our research, we found that there were certain trends in particular that went that that went up because of the effect of of the camera um, and if, and the effect of people staring at themselves and squinting and things like that. So one procedure in particular that is among the most common minimally invasive procedures already and which definitely showed a spike in the pandemic was neurotoxin procedures. So common brands uh, for these would be like Botox, Dysport. Zeoman. Um, those would be the three most common. And it was already, as I mentioned, um, before the pandemic, these were steadily on the rise for the past 20 years. However, there was a stark rise uh, during the pandemic, higher than ever before. Um, and what was interesting is that when we, our research team here at Harvard Medical School, surveyed during the pandemic, both aesthetic doctors and we did a study of uh, just regular people online where we posted an anonymous survey that was taken over by over 7,000 people. And we, we also surveyed almost 150 providers, you know, aesthetic providers. Um, and what we found in both cases is that people were really sensitive to wrinkles around their eyes. Mm -hmm. And if we think about it, people aren't used to squinting when they're looking in the mirror, but suddenly, they were staring at themselves and, and other people on a video conferencing screen for hours. So it's possible that they had wrinkles when they squinted before, but they weren't looking in the mirror before, or it's possible that all of that straining to look at the computer uh, was not helping the situation. So that was an example of something that was really common and went up and could have actually been related to the platform that people were using for work and socialization. And is that there's a great question in the chat um, from my colleague Liz Mosley about um, what is the, the lower legal age limit for having cosmetic surgery, I guess, in the US? I'm not sure if anyone knows here in the UK. Is there one? That's a great uh, question. It's one that I've never uh, personally uh, really had to think about as, as a physician because I don't tend to treat people that would not be able to <laughs> consent for their own procedures. Um, you know, I think um, for having medical procedures in general, without the consent of a parent, a person would need to be over the age of 18 years old. Um, and I've never, you know, heard of treating someone aesthetically that was you know, even near the age where that would be a mm -hmm. question. Um, but, I, but I think it's an important question. You know, for example, 
uh, in the US, for example, in the dermatology community, I was involved with a lot of uh, health policy that work that we did uh, over the past several years about the indoor tanning industry because people were, for example, you know, teenage girls were um, going to tanning salons and raising their risk of skin cancer by tanning before the age of 18. So that's, that's an example of where the medical community interacted with Congress and had legislation passed in many states of the US where there was a minimum age. You know, now for this, because it's a medical procedure, there should certainly be a minimum age, but even, um, even for people that are older than that, I think that there really could be you know, a medical ethics issue um, mm. in many cases, even for people that are over 18. Thank you. Uh, I'll come back, no doubt, with more, more questions, but I wanted to come to, um, to Louisa. Um, Louisa and I, I have to say, have had um, a long conversation already because I, I um, uh, a few weeks ago came across a story about Linda Evangelista, which kind of kick-started my interest in, in a particular procedure. But Louisa, you're sort of on the other side of, of the fence, really, because you deal with a lot of cosmetic procedures that have gone wrong and how that affects people and people looking uh, for some kind of legal action. So tell me, what do you generally see um, from, from the legal perspective and, and who generally comes to you for, for help? Right. So as Dr. Karosh pointed out that in the last 20 years, there has been more interest in cosmetic procedures. And also the technology has changed so much over the course of the last even, you know, 10 to 15 years. So there are a lot of cosmetic products that are now available and put in the hands of not only learned, experienced plastic surgeons, right? Um, the manufacturers kind of want to expand these products to allow more practitioners to be able to use them. Now, that's a great thing because it allows to for people to have access to these products, right? They don't necessarily want to um, even mentally schedule an appointment with a plastic surgeon because maybe that means something uh, much grander to them than to fix a small little wrinkle around the eye. Um, but also uh, the procedures that are done at, say, a nurse practitioner's office, which is um, in America, they're under um, or lower um, experience-wise and um, what they're allowed to do as, as far as medical procedures than a medical doctor, right? But they're going to charge less. So it gives accessibility to these medical or um, cosmetic procedures to uh, people that would normally not be able to afford um, plastic surgery, right? Or how we think of plastic surgery, we assume it's, it's more expensive. And the problem is that I'm seeing in my practice, because my practice mostly focuses on cosmetic procedure injuries, is that a lot of mistakes are done not by plastic surgeons, not by people who are trained and are very careful and very knowledgeable about what they're doing, but by those lower medical professionals who kind of get access to these products and do not necessarily take the time to learn about the adverse effects of a product. Um, everything, uh, you know, everything that has benefits to it also has very serious and sometimes very life altering uh, side effects. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's what we saw with Linda Evangelista, kind of her claims in regard to pool sculpting, but I've seen it with dermal fillers. I've seen it um, with other types of laser hair removal, things like that. Um, I should say, I'm sorry if my internet is a bit patchy, but if I do drop out for any reason, my colleague Liz will jump in until I can come back, but um, let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, Louisa, why don't you tell us about the cool sculpting story and how it kind of catapulted into the headlines recently with the Linda Evangelista Instagram post. Sure. Uh, cool sculpting is a great idea in, th in theory, right? It kind of avoids the plastic surgeon's office. It's advertised as a non-invasive, non-surgical solution to getting rid of that stubborn fat that everyone can find on their body. Um, and I, I can tell you everyone, because some of the clients that I've talked to, I mean, they look to me completely like they do not need to remove any fat but i think everyone subjectively has those areas that bother them the most and i think in our society fat is a big issue on our minds 
So ultimately, Cool Sculpting came up with this a solution where you just freeze your fat. And the idea is that a medical device that was designed by a company, a manufacturer, um, is uh, sold to a provider, a medical provider. So that could be either a medical doctor, a plastic surgeon's office, or even um, I've seen it in uh, offices that are owned by nurse practitioners and physician assistants who are not medical doctors, right? And it's easy to use. Um, it practically works on its own. The technician, the person that is attaching the device itself onto the person that's looking to freeze their fat, all they need to do is place the applicator properly and correctly and push a button. The device kind of does all the work. It sucks up the fat, it freezes it to a particular temperature. It's supposed to stop the temperature if it gets too cold um, to alert the, you know, whoever the technician that it's not safe. Otherwise, it will go through the cycle of a 30, 30 minutes to 60 minutes, depending on um, the version of the applicator. And so this sounds like a great idea. Um, it's advertised as you come into the office and within 30 minutes, practically, you can have this procedure done. And then over the course of three to four months, you basically are watching your fat melt away. Um, well, what we found out is that in some cases it works effectively and people do say really good things about it. But in other cases, it can cause the opposite effect of its advertised purpose. So in some people, it tends to grow the area that bothered the person the most. It turns it into a permanent mass. So it no longer is now, you're not able to um, diet and exercise it away, right? And it's um, from what we know, it's a hardened mass that will stay with the person for the rest of their lives unless they surgically remove it. And what we found out also is that in many cases, it's, it requires multiple surgeries to try to remove the mass. And I think the story um, teaches us that with everything that we do to our bodies, we should be knowledgeable about what can go wrong and under what circumstances. With this condition that I'm talking about, which is called paradoxical adipose hyperplasia, it is not, um, a person doesn't develop it because the technician or the provider placed the applicator wrong or did not screen a person correctly. It's just a natural response of a body to this particular procedure. And that is an important thing for anyone undergoing any type of cosmetic procedure to know is what is the product that I want to use on my body and what could go wrong? Um, ultimately. And we don't know the incident rate of these masses, this PAH response, do we? It's quite a kind of murky picture about they've published the, the company that, that owns the, the patent or the IP is called Zeltique, is that right? It was initially Zeltique. It was taken over by Allergan, which is the manufacturer of Botox and Juvederm, which is a filler. Those are the popular products um, people might recognize. And since May of 2020, it was taken over by an even larger company called Obvi Inc. And this is a huge moneymaker, we should say also. Th there's something curious about the way that the machine works. Can you just explain that side of it too? Uh, the device, unlike other medical devices, was programmed to actually not work when a provider wants it to work. You have to buy permission from the manufacturer every time you want to use it on a patient through these consumable cards, which um, basically the doctor that owns this device has to purchase a certain number of procedures from the manufacturer each time they want to use the device on patients. So the manufacturer actually makes more money on the procedures themselves rather than selling the device to the provider, which is very interesting because if you think of a traditional uh, medical device such as a laser, right, for laser hair removal, once that device is sold to the provider, the provider can use it as many times as they want. They just push the button and they operate it. Well, the cool sculpting device unlike those type other, any other device that I know of, and I've spoken to other medical providers who say that it works unlike any other medical device in that the manufacturer controls how and when it is used. 
Mm. It's it's such a powerful. It seemed to me that the, the cool sculpting is sort of a parable for for where we are today with sort of how we treat beauty, but also this very stigmatized relationship that we have with fat because I think a lot of people at some point in their lives will have had this fantasy that if they could just sort of get rid of the fat on their body or a particular part of their body that they hate that you could just melt it away or cut it off or just you know and I suppose cool sculpting delivers on that fantasy that you just have to lie there nobody's going to cut you open there's not going to be any downtime and somehow it will just disappear and then this paradoxical response is I kind of imagined it as the body just saying, no, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not fulfilling this, this standard I'm refusing and, and this sort of um, bizarre response that is obviously so distressing and, and difficult for, for the people that, that get it is the sort of, is somehow the kind of glitch in the system, as it were. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to look at the reality of these, how these products are manufactured, right? As a manufacturer decides to come up with a solution to a problem, right? A filler, for example. Um, people have wrinkles they want to fill or they want lips that are larger, right? So what do they come up with? A filler. It solves that problem. But with every solution, then that creates room for other problems, these adverse effects that come about. And the issue, and I think it's so important for consumers to realize, is the manufacturer that solves a problem with their product, they are not incentivized to research the adverse effects that their product causes. So with cool sculpting, when they realized that paradoxical adipose hyperplasia was an adverse effect, it was an unanticipated, they were completely blindsided by it, right? When they realized that this was an adverse effect, they also realized that this is not really good for them as the manufacturer, because if people find out about it, they may be discouraged from undergoing this procedure. The more information a manufacturer has, the more responsibility they have, right? And, and also it costs a lot of money to now do clinical trials on adverse effects. And so there's no interest or incentive into investigating that. And that's what I think consumers need to know and what providers also need to know. Um, what I found through litigating against the cool sculpting's manufacturer is that the doctors purchasing this medical device relied on what the manufacturer represented to them about the product, right? In a lot of cases, they say, why wouldn't I believe the manufacturer? I assume they are telling me the truth. And really, when we looked at the documents that the manufacturer had in their possession since day one, when they found out about this adverse effect versus how little they were representing or informing the providers, there's a stark difference. Mm. And that's so important for us all to remember is we cannot be naive to the fact that there may be more information and we need to become informed independently about what we're doing to our body. Mm, thank you. I'd like to come to a couple of people in the chat who have been making great points. Um, I see my colleague Liz Mosley has been uh, saying a few interesting things. Liz, are you there? Hello. Hello. I'm out and about, sorry. That's okay. Can you hear me? Um, <laughs> so I, oh gosh, what have I got to say that's interesting? Only that I would 100% be target market for a procedure that makes me thinner and more beautiful without pain or hassle. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of horrified that everybody has to look brilliant all the time. I sort of feel like the bar would always be raised, even if that thing existed. In five years time, I, it still wouldn't be good enough because I think that the sort of standard of what people are meant to look like just on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly for younger people, is so impossibly high. And, and I hear people say, and I, be and I believe them, I want to have filler because I don't like my wrinkles and I, I feel upset when I see myself on Zoom. I, I know that that is a real experience, but I sort of think, how sad, really. Mm. We should all be a bit more okay with looking rubbish because you didn't even have to be attractive to be a pop star in the 80s. But now you have to be attractive to get a job in an office. I think that's a bit of a shame. 
we should all be okay with looking a bit rubbish sounds like a, a really good um motto that we should all adopt um I mean, Dr. Dr. Shadi Kurosh, is, is that something that perhaps you could pick up on that idea that we sort of lock ourselves into a loop of needing ever more procedures and it's very difficult to get out of? Because as you say, a lot of it is, it is about sort of denying the natural chronology of our bodies and, and we can't stop that. Well, Liz's conclusion was actually one of the conclusions of our research. So. So um, I, I want to commend Liz on the message that, that she's sharing because really when I um, started to, to do the research and my research team came around this topic of Zoom dysmorphia and, and all the research that we've done around this issue for the past year and a half, it was at, really at its core, at its foundation, a mental health issue. And and basically, it was the response of doctors in the aesthetic community uh, to a situation where we thought, wow, our patients are really being too hard on themselves, and this isn't healthy. And we need to, we need to start raising awareness about this to promote healthy behaviors. And so really, that was at the core of, of our entire research mission was mm -hmm. to raise awareness um, of you know this preoccupation um, and the anxiety that it was causing, and what were the factors that that were leading to this? And even before the pandemic, we know that social media had been contributing to this. The way that our society has been has been changing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to to Liz's point, this idea that people felt that they had to look great all the time it was accentuated during the pandemic because suddenly they were on. All the time, they they had to be, you know, on video conferencing, visible uh, mm -hmm. to people, expected to look, you know, presentable or you know, or more than presentable, all the time, while they were in isolation, not seeing the friends and loved ones who usually give them, you know, the reassurance, "Gosh, you look great," or there's all these other things about your personality that I appreciate, <laughs> you know, sort of drawing attention, you know, to other things. So here people are in isolation, not, um, not interacting with the aspects of life, the exercise, the hobbies, the interactions with loved ones that would hopefully keep a person more grounded and feeling more healthy about their appearance, feeling more healthy about themselves as a person. They were not in touch with these things. And here they are in isolation, viewing social media, spending more time on social media than they normally would, where we know that the overwhelming majority of photos are edited and this is kind of an unfair situation where they're seeing a distorted view of themselves on Zoom. They're seeing other people's perfectly edited photos on social media. I mean, if that's not the perfect storm to give anyone anxiety and self-consciousness, then I don't know what it is. Um, I'd like to come to Ollie now um, and then I'll, I'd like to pick up with Patricia about whose responsibility it is to try and sort of maintain uh, some kind of workable standards so that, you know, young people in particular and young women, I suppose, especially don't feel like they have an impossible standard to reach. Ollie, hello. Hi. Hi. So I, I know you have a very particular um, journey with with uh, plastic surgery. And, and could you just tell us how you've used it to transform the way that you look? So I've really become a totally different person through plastic surgery. I started my journey in 2013. And since then, I've had quite a number of procedures. Um, you know, I've done my nose six times. I did it quite recently. I had an eye surgery. Um, and for me, plastic surgery has really been um, transforming in the sense that it's given me a lot of confidence uh, I've really been able to kind of express myself more whereas before I had a lot of insecurities so it's really changed my life completely and um, as uh, the doctor was saying earlier about how you know social media can influence people you know I also agree that a lot of people these days do have the kind of zoom dysmorphia or snapchat people want to look like snapchat filters and you know I don't want to look like a filter. I want a very specific look, which is the Korean K-pop star look. And, you know, because I've done these surgeries, I feel like this has helped me become a K-pop singer myself and it's helped with my success. So, you know, I do credit plastic surgery with transforming my life and having a very positive effect. You know, I don't obviously go out there and encourage people to keep, you know, doing surgeries. I just encourage people to 
find confidence within themselves. And, you know, if plastic surgery is something that's going to change their life, you know, for instance, some ladies, if they have flat chest, it's a real confidence issue for them. And that can really be life changing if they have, you know, an increase in the size. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's been a, a journey for me. I've had, I think, about 20 procedures in total. I'm kind of at the end of the road now. Um, I'm super happy with the results. Um, but, you know, obviously with plastic surgery, if you're going to a surgeon, it's very important to make informed decisions. Uh, I have made mistakes in the past. I chose a doctor based on their Instagram pictures um, and that turned out to be a disaster. So, you know, I would encourage everyone listening at home, you know, if you do go for plastic surgery, make sure to do your research, make sure they're board certified um, and make sure you know what the procedure is about the recovery time. Because, you know, I've learned all of these things um, over time. And there's also so many non-surgical procedures. So, you know, I, I do a lot of filler, Botox, uh, vampire facials. So there are so many alternatives for people that may not want to go into the knife, and may not want to go into the anesthetic to kind of just try some filler, try some Botox, see how they feel. Um, obviously, as you were saying about the cool sculpting, uh, Linda Evangelista did have that horror story. And with any procedure, there can be horror stories. But obviously, these are quite uh, rare cases. And for me, I've had a few horror stories with no surgeries. Um, and I've been to a few doctors which have actually left me physically scarred very badly, um, unable to breathe. So I would, you know, luckily now I've, I've been making better decisions. I've had much better doctors. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's it's been a long journey for me, but a journey of discovery. Wow. I mean, there's so many things that you've said that I would just I would love to to um, hear more about, but particularly the sort of Korean aspect, because that is, let's be honest, quite a controversial thing. And I know that you've been criticized a lot for, for the idea of being transracial and being able to become Korean or, or t how, how do you conceptualize that in your mind? So I've um, spent uh, a year of my time in Korea. I used to live there. So I really got kind of immersed in the culture. And, you know, every day of my life is revolving around Korean culture. I spend a lot of time with Korean people, have a Korean teacher. So I really do base my life around Korea. And, and that's where I do identify as Korean. You know, I spend a lot of time in the country uh, surrounded by the people. So that's kind of the way I feel. But, you know, I always like to to, to explain to people that, while what I'm doing might seem unusual to people in Western societies, uh, in countries like Korea, China, Japan, uh, you know, so many people do undergo procedures to have predominantly uh, Caucasian features. So they might go for a higher nose bridge. They might want to get a double eyelid surgery or a V-line jaw surgery. Um, so it's kind of, you know, interesting. I always like to explain that is while what I'm doing in the UK might seem a little bit different, uh, in Asia, there are millions of people actually doing the opposite of me and kind of wanting kind of more Caucasian features. For me, I just, I love the Korean features. You know, I think the eyes are very beautiful, the nose, the jaw shape. Um, so I've really modeled myself um, on the kind of Korean features and it's, you know, it's still a work in progress. Um, but, you know, I feel like, you know, we're at a time in history now, it's 2021, people are very open-minded. So I feel we are, you know, able to express ourselves in different ways and, you know, I hope over time people will be a little bit more understanding and see that, you know, I do feel Korean, I identify as Korean, I know so much about the country, the culture, and I, I do plan to live there in the future. So, you know, I hope people can understand that uh, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm a great ambassador for Korea. I, I spend a lot of time promoting um, Korean culture, K-pop music, Korean dramas. Um, you know, I do a lot of talk shows around the world promoting uh, those aspects of Korea. So, for me, I, I feel like it's complete cultural appreciation um, and Korean people, they really appreciate what I do as well. Um, when I've been to Korea or when I'm in Koreatown in Los Angeles, I always get very positive comments. Um, they're always very sweet and they're always very flattered that um, I've really embraced their culture. Okay. But the things that you're describing to me sound quite extreme you know the, the kinds of the procedures that you've you've said that you've had or, or that that are, are maybe more common and I wonder about that sort of perception shift that it starts perhaps with a few fillers and then you kind of become comfortable with the idea that you know you could have your eyelids done or your jaw shape changed and and that feels like I guess the kind of part of the bigger picture that we're trying to get to that there is just a sort of a shift towards a set of beauty standards and and procedures to get them that that are quite extreme like you say there are horror stories this is after all 
a lot of what you're describing is invasive, it's surgery, it's not injections and, and things that I guess a lot of people would consider to be minimally invasive. Is there a danger in that? Because, you know, you, you I've seen some YouTube videos of yours where you say your nose was go perhaps going to fall off. That is at the extreme end, no? Well, obviously, what I've gone through is very extreme um, compared to other people. And as uh, Dr. Karusha was saying earlier, there really has been a shift in more people wanting to do procedures. So, you know, a lot of uh, particularly women, but there's a big increase in men getting Botox filler these days. Um, so obviously, I've gone a little bit more extreme, but I do feel like, um, as Dr. Karusha was saying, the lockdown did have an impact on people because people were at home. You know, they were looking in the mirror, looking on screens all days. Mm -hmm. They had no social contact. So there was no one there to say, oh, you look beautiful today. I love the way you look today. There was there's none of that. So, of course, there's been a dramatic increase. And as with Snapchat, Instagram filters, uh, people do want to look more extreme these days. People want a bigger eyes, um, bigger lips. So there is, of course, a danger in that. Uh, like I said, if you do make a, a bad decision, not an informed decision and you go to a doctor that is not so experienced or maybe a doctor that's not even qualified because maybe the price is cheaper you know there is a risk in even with things like botox if you get the botox wrong about the forehead around the eye that can leave you with a deformity which can last six months can last longer and you can sometimes even be unable to open your eyes so you know while what i've done is a little bit extreme and you know people are getting a little bit more extreme with the way they want to look these days um as long as people make an informed decision you know, um, and know what their goal is. So for me, since 2013, my goal was to look, I have the Korean pop star look. So I knew I had to do a lot of things. It wasn't like, you know, I had a surgeon and I thought, okay, I need to do something else. I'd already knew what I needed to do to achieve my look. But there is a danger of people, you know, they start doing something and then they can't stop. Um, you know, which plastic surgery, you know, when you see the results and you feel beautiful, people compliment you, it does kind of make you think, okay, I need to do more. So there is definitely um, a snowball effect with that. Um, for me personally, it's just, you know, I always had a vision of what I want to look like. So it's just, I've always seen myself as a work in progress, but there are so many non-surgical alternatives these days. So people that, you know, don't want to go to the extreme and they just want to experiment, uh, they can get fillers and fillers can also be dissolved if they're not happy with the results as well. So there are certainly lots of alternatives, um, but I do feel, yeah, with Snapchat, with Instagram, people now do want those very extreme looks, the big uh, breasts, big lips, uh, even uh, for women getting the big butts as well. You know, that's become a trend and that's actually one of the most dangerous procedures. Um, you know, you do hear horror stories in Turkey where women do die. In Brazil, women die from these BBL procedures. So they definitely run a risk of getting blood clots, um, which can lead to, you know, uh, you dying, basically. So as long as people make an informed decision and, you know, know what their goal is from the outset, you know, I feel like plastic surgery can be very beneficial in terms of changing someone's life. Fantastic. Thank you. I th sorry, I think my internet dropped out, but hopefully it didn't dis disturb anything. Um, thank you so much, Ollie. Um, I wanted to come to my colleague, Patricia, who was making a um, point about whose responsibility it is to sort of safeguard. Um, uh, Patricia, are you there? Hello. I'm here. Hi. Do you want yeah. to make it again? I mean, I guess I was struck by what Dr. Grosh said about um, how ultimately this comes down to mental health and, and you know we've been talking so much about Instagram face, Snapchat face. TikTok was criticized in July of 2021 because they automatically applied beauty filters um, which sort of whitened and, and restructured the face to make it look a bit thinner and bigger eyes and so on. Um, and, and you've got apps like Instagram which apply filters which make you look more beautiful. You know are they responsible? I think they should be responsible for, for the way that, um, or at least acknowledge the impact that face altering features that they have on their devices can um, can have. I know a friend of, I went to visit a friend of mine who lives in Vietnam and she had a Samsung phone and the phone came automatically installed with a with a with this thing in the photo app that made your, your jawline thinner and your eyes bigger because of what um, someone was saying earlier about how in, in sort of parts of, of East Asia, there's, there's a trend to make your face look westernized. To me, the fact that that just comes automatically is absolutely, um, you know, it's really shocking. And it reminds me about when we talked about um, the, the effect that, that magazines and other media has on, on women and how they should be responsible. I think that tech um, is in its sort of occupying this media space should be thinking about the way in which it impacts 
young women yeah. in particular, but all of us. That's really interesting. G- uh, Jilly, could I come to you? You've made a great point about um, it feeling a bit like an arms race. Would you mind just um, telling us more about what you mean? If you're there. Yes, I can do. Thank you for Hello. It's a bit of terrible lighting. So uh, thankfully we're all going, yay, let's all look bad tonight on Zoom. So. <laughs> um i yeah i was just um there's somebody in the comments above actually mentioned something um uh to do with um it being an arms race and it's a it's a phrase i've used before with my friends um in that um some of them are are actually younger than me by five six seven years and they are getting uh procedures done and I'm I'm quite against it in the sense that I think we're in this sort of weird matrix sort of time where we're not allowed to look um, our age in many you know it feels more and more that you know it's 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 down to us to be as good looking as we possibly can um, and I've raised it almost as a feminist issue with with them uh, in that um, if we are proud and and, and have self confidence it, it's a feminist sort of principle in a way to try not to be pulled into this. Um, and they've reacted extremely um, <laughs> negatively against me because of it. Um, and, and quite rightly, they've said, well, where does it start and finish? Makeup, hair dye, dressing well, mm-hmm. keeping fit. Um, I would say that there is a distinction between those things. Um, and I think that it's it's proving more and more difficult to, to feel that I can be my age and my face be my age and me be happy with that um, when everybody seems very smooth, you know, and very plumped. Um, and it's it just makes me feel a bit awkward and a bit, you know, unsettled. Um, mm. I don't think it's gonna change my view, but I know that there is a pressure and I think it's building. So I just you wanted to push that out. No, 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 that's really, it's, it's, it's sort of sad to hear you say that, but I definitely feel the same thing too, that, um, that there's a kind of weight that bears down on you and it's difficult sometimes to make sense of what exactly you think of it. But I I was struck by this sort of sense that on the one hand, we must sort of meet uh, a set of standards, but we also mustn't admit that we have done anything to try and meet them, that there's a sort of secrecy that's involved. And I wonder whether you see that with your friends who are maybe, are they reluctant to talk about what they've had done or are they pretty open about it? Some are and some aren't. Um, So... I think it depends on the person. I think, you know, mostly they're sort of a little bit sheepish, but don't mind, you know, giving you a, a, a wink and a nudge, you know, if you push them um, to say, yeah, you know, I did. Um, yeah, it depends very much. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks so much for, for that contribution. Um, Danielle, I wanted to come to you because um, if you're happy to speak, uh, about what you've been talking about in the chat uh, on screen, just about your own experience of choosing to have um, some procedures. Are you there? Hello. Hello. Are you happy? Are you happy to chat? Of course. Go. Yes. So, so, um, so maybe repeat what you were. A few of the things that you've been um, saying in the in the chat as we talk. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so I started having Botox probably in my late twenties um, when I noticed uh, what they call the the gabellas lines here, the, the frown lines where you, you find yourself permanently looking angry without looking angry. Um, and I just wanted those um, lined out. Um, and then I suppose it's something that you get into the habit of having done every couple of years. And certainly in, in my, age, my age range, I'm in my late forties now, a lot of my friends are having the same things. Um, but it is one of those things that once you start with it, you do have to keep it maintained and you do have to you know um, keep up with it um but it, it it's a case it, it was never a case of a, a vanity thing if, for me it was um something that was um really really quite um obvious when I was in my late 20s which is really quite young to have any kind of wrinkles and something that I've just kind of kept up with every couple of years ever since then um um, haven't actually got to the stage of having an actual facelift yet. <laughs> but is that something that you feel that you would be, do, do you feel like now that you've had some Botox, uh, that that might be next on this, is that a natural progression or does that feel too much? 
it's too much at this stage. I mean, I'm 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 48 now. Um, I, I think that's too far too early to start getting far uh, invasive with actual surgical procedures. Um, but um, it, it certainly as as far as um, Botox goes, and I think people who that haven't had Botox think that it's quite painful. Um, I've I've sat in a chair before quite early on and had um, new customers come in and watch while it's go on, gone on while. Um, uh, while it's while I, they've injected me and um, just so that they know that it's not that painful and it really isn't that bad and I think it just gives you a sense of it, it, it really does um just iron out wrinkles that maybe other people don't see um but it also gives a, a sense of uh well-being and confidence that maybe you didn't have before so I, I, I'm all for it really great thank you thanks for talking about it because I know it's something that is sometimes quite uh, difficult to to talk about. Um, I wanted to come back to Louisa just for a sort of closing um, cl a closing thought about because you're sort of on the front line of trying to hold various companies accountable when things go wrong. I wonder what you think as journalists. What what where who do you think we should be pursuing as we sort of face this tsunami of of interest in in cosmetic procedures? And where do you think? as it were, accountability for where things go wrong lies? Is it with the big companies? Is it with the people who are who are practicing aesthetics? Um, wh where should we go? Yeah, I think it is only because of journalism and the pursuit of the truth. That is the only way consumers can really know the truth when they're doing their own research, right? And ultimately what we must remember is the manufacturer is the person with the most knowledge, with the superior knowledge about all the things that can go wrong with their products. And they make a decision on whether to share that information with the world or not to share that information. And ultimately what happens and what I've seen, for example, in cool sculpting is the medical community is very much relying on the information that the manufacturer is providing. And sometimes you will find misstatements of facts about the incidence rate, for example, of a, the, a particular adverse effect because they are led to believe by the manufacturer that it's rare. And then that word rare gets recycled and reused in medical literature because the authors that are writing these medical scholarly articles do not have any other reason to believe that it's not rare, right? So I think as journalists, it's so important to seek the truth directly from the people making the most money off of these products. And they are the manufacturers because when an adverse effect occurs, the first thing that a provider does is they report this adverse effect to the manufacturer, right? They let the manufacturer know that mm -hmm. my patient has suffered a side effect. I want to let you know, I want to determine whether it is you know, my error or whether it's the product's error, it's a known adverse effect. And the manufacturer keeps a database of all of these reports. And ultimately they are the knower of this information and they keep that information very close to their chest because in America, we have the FDA that allows them or does not allow them to put these products on the market. And so they're very um, careful about what they will allow the public to know just because the FDA is also paying attention and they hold the keys to their wallet, basically, right? If mm -hmm. the product is cleared to be on the market, they're making money. If the, if the product is pulled off the market, because now we have now we're aware of thousands of adverse effects rather than a handful or hundreds, right? Then we have um, something to investigate here. So mm -hmm. I think it's so important. And um, I thank you, Beisha, very much for becoming interested in the story. It's so relevant to all of us. Um, I get cosmetic procedures done. We all, I think, will get to a point where we will um, try to improve our looks. It's something that's important to us as um, members of society. But I think truth and information is important because the reason that my clients come to me and say, I want to pursue litigation against either a provider or a manufacturer is because they are completely side blinded or blindsided, sorry, by the adverse effect. Had they been told, had they been uh, knowledgeable about it? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a risk that they took knowingly. 
And that's the big difference is when we experiment with our bodies, that's totally our free choice. And, and, you know, I encourage that. I think that's great. If you think something can help you um, love yourself, right? But at the same time, as a consumer, you need to have the truth and the information out there so you can make an educated decision for yourself. Is my bulge of fat that bothersome to me that I'm willing to take the risk of the opposite effect? If it is too big of a bother, then it's fine, but at least you knew. And if yeah. it's not on second thought, maybe I'll diet and exercise, leave it alone or get liposuction, right? That has a better result um, for the same amount of money, actually, then I will forgo the risk because I don't want to have to deal with this unknown mass growing in my body. It's all about information. Thanks, Louisa. Um, we are out of time. And um I just thought I would try and summarize briefly, and I hope my internet is going to stay stable, but if it doesn't, you were all allowed to leave. But um, some of the things that we heard this evening that particularly stuck with me, the idea that actually the tech that we're using is kind of set up to make us feel bad because the way that the camera works is always going to sort of skew how we see ourselves. And that feels like something that we don't know enough about and, and actually has would have quite a big impact on how we see ourselves, given that so many of us sort of refract how we see ourselves through the world online. There's a sort of tsunami of dis dissatisfaction with how we look because of the pandemic um, and that's obviously not helped by the ways in which we're using our phones. Procedures that bypass plastic surgeons are often the ones that go wrong when you get into procedures that can be done by people in various contexts that aren't perhaps always medical that seems to be um, where the greatest risk lies. Um, and also there's very little incentive to investigate adverse effects. That's something that Louisa said that I think will stay with me, particularly as I try and keep going on this story about cool sculpting, which as I said, feels to me like a kind of parable for where all these different things might be coming together and going a bit wrong. Um, thank you all uh, for joining and for being so active in the chat. But thank you in particular to um, Dr. Shadi Karush, uh, to Louisa Tarasova and to Oli London. Um, we will keep going on this topic and um, it's been really fantastic to hear all your contributions. So thank you so much and have a great evening. Bye.